Good morning, CLC. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this service. We are grateful to see you. We're grateful to see you if you're on Facebook Live. Please say hi, we love that. And with that, I invite you now to just relax in this moment. Put your day and your week aside. Let go of anything that may be going on just for a moment. If you're so inclined, you can close your eyes, take a few deep breaths. On your out breath, release all tension and stress that may be in your body. Relaxing your forehead and your jaw, relaxing your shoulders. Just release all that no longer serves you. And allow your mind to be here, now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin the inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your right hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of the infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. In visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled 
and gratefully speak these words. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast, and share in confidence and gratitude and saying, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Well, thank you all for being here today in the room. Thank you all for being here today in your room. We should do that some week in my room, you know, Beach Boys. That'd be perfect. Um, isn't it a great song? Yeah. Those harmonies. I don't know. There's a place where I can go. See, we can pull it off. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell my secrets too. You got to do it falsetto. You take the high note. Yeah, I'll take the high note. <laughs> I'll take the high note, you take the low note, and I'll get to Ireland before you or something like that. A little, a little more about the book. Um, we, we, uh, okay. Thank you so much. The one and only copy in existence of this thing. Um, it, it is on Amazon. It's also, you can get it at csl.org. That's our, our headquarters, Centers for Spiritual Living. Go to their csl.org and click on publications, and anyway, you'll find it eventually. This is a, this is a product of 30 years of a Q&A column, and so you may be in it. <laughs> if, if you had a Q, I had an A, so there it is. And uh, anyway, I'm really grateful to Holly Sharp, who's the editor of Science Mind Magazine, who wrote the foreword and did the book design, and Julie Mirau, who edited it, and uh, it's, it's a joy to have this out. I've made a determination. Every 20 years, I'm going to come out with a book. So, all right. The, yeah, this actually, it's only been four weeks. It feels like four weeks. I don't know. It feels like what it feels like. That we've been doing a series based on high mysticism. This series actually will continue into October. And I have an announcement for you because she's too bashful to say herself, but our very excellent guest speaker next Sunday, no guest. She's sitting right down here, right front. Danielle Mercadel, practitioner, <laughs> will be speaking at 11 o'clock. Please come hear her or tune in on Facebook Live or YouTube. And she's going to be working out of high mysticism. And then the last four Sundays of October, I will too, because it's a big book and it's got a lot of stuff in it. Plus, we have a lot to say because we're not just parroting Emma Curtis Hopkins. It's, there's a lot of original thought goes into this. And we, we take her words, and I think she would approve, you know, and, and uh, take them where they, where they go in our hearts and all. So um, on the first Sunday in September, I talked about the idea that there's a foundation under your feet, and you could trust balance yourself, bend slightly at the knees, you know, and, and trust life, trust nature out of which you came. The second week talked about the other direction, above, up, up. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. And the idea that there's a power that runs over you, uh, that you can reach up to out of this world, that you can look up to the stars and see hope and see eternity and see time and see space and I was amazed the other day to read how they've discovered these dust galaxies that exist 
at the edge of space and time. That sounds like poetry, but it's actually literally at the edge of space and time. And they've only just discovered them because they're, well, dusty. They're hard to spot, you know? These ancient things that date back, uh, gosh, what was it? 300 billion years, I think something like that. These distant lands, you know? Well, you look at that, what are you gonna do with that? You look at that and it gives you a sense of the enormity of life. And in some cases, how minuscule we are. But then if we're the ones that are beholding the enormity of life and we have a place to put that within ourselves, how small are we? So that was the second week of the series. Last week I talked about looking around at the, at the fellow godlings. And you're gonna hear an amazing song as soon as I finish this talk that, that, really, that really speaks to that, about turning toward. But around us there are all these godlings and they are our demonstrations. They are our answers to prayer, and we are their answers to prayer. And everybody's getting, and everybody's giving. And if you hold something tightly in your hands, it's very difficult to receive, it's very difficult to give, it's very difficult to do anything but cling, you know? So we want to, we want to release as much as possible and trust. And we talked about how Form is in the process of dissolution. In other words, everything that comes into form, as soon as it hits form, begins to redistribute itself back into pure potential. So where we want to put our energy is in the realm of potential, and specifically in the realm of how we feel about things. And that brings us to today, where having looked beneath and up and around, now we're going to look within, which is really where we've been looking all along, because you don't look one place only. But we look within ourselves, we find within ourselves the power to choose, the power to manifest. Now, a question that comes up very often is, is new thought, is this teaching all about manifesting? All about manifesting stuff, manifesting things, items? No, it isn't. Well, then why are the, the early New Thought texts so focused on manifesting and demonstrating things, items? And the reason, I think, is because that's where people tend to put their attention. And so you've got to grab people where their attention is, where their attention is focused. You know, it's kind of like this. It's, I took a course... I, I was briefly in, in advertising many years ago, and I took a, a course in college on, on advertising and marketing. And it was there that I learned about demographic targeting. And this is like a long time ago, so a lot of things didn't exist that do now in terms of platforms, you know. But the idea was that if there's a certain product that you want to sell, you decide who's likely to buy it, and then you buy time you buy ad time on the broadcast media when that target audience is likely to be watching during the programs they're likely to be watching or you buy print media in the periodicals and so on that that target audience is likely to be reading so what do sports fans like you know beer comes to mind <laughs> okay brats, <laughs> you know, uh, bratwurst, uh, stuff like, let's say beer, let's say beer. When's the last time you sat in a spiritual center and heard talk about beer? But anyway, so you want to sell beer. Well, a lot of people drink beer, and especially back in the day, a whole lot of people drank beer. And so, but you would market it, hey, you're having a party, you're having some people over to watch the big game, then you'll want this kind of beer. Because that's where their attention was. Or that was the presumption anyway, and it usually worked out. It's a season of parties coming up. We're heading into the holiday time of year, right? People are gonna be thinking about throwing parties and buying food. So you, you, wanna, you wanna address that in some way. And then you also find that there are seasons of the year when they sell mattresses and washing machines and the new car models come out and different, you know, uh, I don't know, towels or bowling balls or something. There's always a season for it that's 
And this is discovered by a lot of research. This is determined. So you catch people where their attention is. Old thought religion addressed people thinking about death, thinking about the afterlife, thinking about the beyond. How do I survive? They say, well, what we have for you is salvation. That got everybody's attention. New thought religion tends to address practicalities of life. We're not so much into salvation versus damnation, believing that all of us go on forever, accompanied by the contents of our consciousness. But right now, people are concerned about things. During the Great Depression, people were concerned about things. The end of the 19th century, when Emma Hopkins was writing, people were concerned about things. So she addressed them about the concern. The concerns that women had, who had very poor health care, high child mortality rates, and so on, uh, were not able to be freely in the workforce. Struggling, domestic abuse was rampant and unchecked, you know. So that was the audience that she was speaking to, and she spoke in, in very plain terms to that group. As times changed, it became more about people needed money, like I said in the Great Depression. It's when Think and Grow Rich came out. It's when a lot of these books about you know, prosperity came out. They were written for a direct need that people had. They were meeting the case. But there's more. And that's where high mysticism comes in. You see, sometimes we play like whack-a-mole in our lives with our problems. I need money. Poof. Okay, now I need you know, some friends. Poof. Now I need a relationship. Poof. Now my health is in question. You know, poof, poof, poof. I'm aging. I'm this, that. You know, and, and so we're running around patching stuff up. High mysticism is an umbrella. High mysticism is a containment system, really, around all of this saying, come unto me, ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Saying, there is one life, and that life is the answer to all your problems. And that you're here for more than you thought. Because even with the acquisition of all of the items that you might want in your life, you'd realize that there's a context that may not be present, may not accompany them. You need a context for your life. Context to your life is your purpose, what you came to this world to do, your cosmic purpose. I saw a great meme one time. It said, life is about more than paying bills until you die. <laughs> I mean, that's a little on the nose, but isn't that how some of us live? Isn't that the mode we get into sometimes of thinking, I'm just here to keep up with things? Okay, got another month covered, you know? Now I can struggle. We're meant for more than that. But when you're struggling and you hear that you're meant for more than that, it, it falls right off of you. I don't have time for this. I got to meet the situation. So we work where? In two realms at once. We work in the material and in the spiritual. In the material, we identify, address, and acknowledge problems. If you don't have any money, you pull out your pockets and there's just lint, you know, you say, I have no money. I acknowledge this. And I sure could use some. That's the material side. Then you go to the spiritual side. What is the source of all abundance? What is my life? What is my life? What is the nature of my life? And you treat to know. And then money shows up. Or ideas show up by which money can be produced. Or connections show up. Networking happens and on and on and on. Or expenses just magically go away because that can happen. And so then that problem is resolved or at least addressed in the moment. But here's the better part than that, is that now you've cultivated increased faith in a power that will meet you wherever you are, whatever it is you need to create in your life. And so you'll find, as you go through my book, as you listen to the talks, as you hear when Danielle gets up next week, She's going to have original thoughts on lots of things, but I promise you, somewhere in there, you're going to hear either in these words or alluded to these words, regular spiritual practice. Regular spiritual practice. 
New Thought, New Thought has a, a I don't want to call it a two-edged sword, but I guess I just did. But new, new Thought is like, on the one hand, you're whole, complete, perfect. You're, you're a, a beautiful expression of source. God doesn't judge you. God can't judge you. That's not even possible in the God of our understanding. Life is good. It's beautiful. All of that, right? All of that's absolutely true. Here's the other part of it. You got to work for it in consciousness to accept that, to accept that. Otherwise, it's a painting hanging on the wall. You know, otherwise, it's like, wouldn't that be nice if? It's like a travel poster to a land you'll never visit if you don't do the regular spiritual work of pushing through. There's a saying that says you don't judge, you shouldn't judge other people's insides by their outsides. Have you heard that? You shouldn't judge other people's insides by their outsides. So here comes somebody and they look like they have it all together. Or here comes somebody and they look like a total mess. And, and so you, have, you make this judgment based on, on who you think they are. There's a story, I, don't, I think it's a legend. I don't know how true it is, but it's, it's kind of a cool story that the, the, uh, the man who his, his son, his son was a student at a, at a famous Ivy League university and, and tragically perished some many years ago. And the man went to see the dean or the chancellor of the university and said, I want to, I want to build a, a building in memory of my son. But he didn't look like the kind of man who could build a building, who could fund that. He was apparently dressed as an ordinary working person. And so he was treated with some degree of disdain. We're very sorry about your son, but he's kind of hustled out, you know. His name was Leland Stanford. He went to the other coast, and he founded a university. He founded a university. The only part of that story that I'm not sure of is exactly how he was handled back east. But he was, he, let's put it, he was dismissed. He was dismissed out of the conversation, he went and did this. And well, you can't judge. You can't judge. Furthermore, even if your judgment is accurate, and you decide that somebody's a total mess because they look like it, or you decide they have it all together because they look like it, you're stuck with your judgment. It's, it's a cardboard cutout of people, the judgments that we have about them. It's not the full essence of the person. So the saying goes, don't judge other people's insides by their outsides. I want to add to that, that when we judge other people's insides, we're judging them based on our insides, and that's where the work is done. I can only see you as beautiful, capable, competent, lovable, worthwhile, etc., as I see myself, and no more, and no more. If I don't value myself and I do put you on a pedestal, while I have you on that pedestal, I'm busy sawing it off because I resent, some part of me resents you, resents your success or your popularity or whatever it is because I've not allowed myself to have that. If I do allow myself to have that, then I don't place you on a pedestal. I regard you as a peer. And what I think we want in this life more than anything else is to be regarded as a peer. I got to tell you, on a real personal level, it is a kick for me to come in here on Sundays and let these musicians allow me to, to play the congas or something with them, you know? Because it makes me feel like I'm a musician. And then I feel kind of guilty because I haven't put in the work. I haven't rehearsed. I haven't done all of this. They're working all week. They've trained. Look at, look at the, the, the skill that these folks have, the singers, the instrumentalists, and how they've worked on that. And I just kind of prance in here and, you know, do my, do my thing. But for that moment, it's like, I'm with the band. 
It's such a kick, you know? And they're so kind and accommodating to do that. But what we really want in life is to feel like we belong. Not to be better than, and not, to, not just to serve, you know? Not, not to just be kind of the, the, the uh, what's the old word, the amanuensis, you know, the, the, the servant model, the house elf or whatever for, for others. But, but, but to stand alongside in doing what we do. And thereby to be the Christed ones. And thereby to be the Messiahs. And thereby to be, yep, all that. All that. That's, that's who we are. So the model that I want to recommend to you for life management is to recognize without without fear that you work in two worlds at once you're as uh, I think Eckhart said and Wayne Dyer famously quoted him we are spiritual beings having a human experience rather than a human being who may or may not be having a spiritual experience we are in fact spiritual beings who are in fact having human experiences and in human experiences there are bills to pay and there's shots to get, you know, and there's the oil to be changed in the car and stuff to be handled at different times and different, different seasons of the year have different requirements of us and different times of day and on and on. All of that is at the human level and sometimes the, the works get clogged up, you know, sometimes there are too many demands placed on us at once. People want four different things from us. Everything's not just important, but urgent. And we're completely stressed out, strung out, thinned out, you know. That's when we go to this power. We say, I affirm and know that there's perfect intelligence working through me to guide me into exactly what I need to say and do. There's a perfect intelligence working through every person that I encounter. And I'll leave you with this. From Emma Hopkins, the very end of the book, we jump around in the book, the very end of the book, I think the last paragraph of High Mysticism. She talks about speaking to the angel of your neighbor. And this is the poetry that she uses to describe what we would call, in Ernest Holmes' terms, subjective thought atmosphere. Subjective thought atmosphere. This is where our practitioners work. When we speak the word, as we say, for another, we have our subjective thought atmosphere sort of like a Venn diagram. They kind of overlap, you know, and in that, in that central sliver is, is where the power occurs because you've told me what you want and I have a mental equivalent of what it is you want and I speak back to you what it is you say you want. And suddenly we have entrainment, we have a harmony, we've, we've hit some kind of a, it's like a tuning fork, you know, we've hit some kind of commonality between us and it's in that that I speak my word. All of that sounds very scientific and kind of clinical. She calls it speaking to their angel. She believes and writes how each of us has an angel of our higher natures that has never known suffering, never known lack, never known exclusion, never known poverty, never known harm of any kind. And it's to that that you speak and it's from that that you hear, from that angel. I love this image. And I've told you a story, I'll tell you a story real quick again about angels where, uh, you know me, I say in conclusion then you get another five minutes. It's, consider it over time. Consider it like soccer. See, there's extra time in soccer, and you never know how long it is till the referee blows the whistle. I went to a minister's conference one time where we all flew in from wherever we were, you know. And, uh, and when we got there, and we were all checking in with each other in a room. Uh, one of my colleagues got up and she said this. She said, so on the way here, she had like a five hour flight I forget where we were. I think it was Washington, D.C., but she had a long flight from where she lived and worked. And she said, so I got on the plane, and, uh, 
and they were smoking. This is a while ago. They were smoking in the back. And it was filling the cab. And they were crying babies. It was hot. The air wasn't working right. There was stuff, just annoying stuff. Some people were, had, I think, had had a little too much to drink. And there was some loud conversations going on. And she thought, God, I'm going to have this miserable, five hours, I'm stuck with this pe these people. I'm going to have this miserable flight. And then she remembered there's a way out because there's a way in. And she started to imagine that every person on that flight, including the crew, all had big, white, fuzzy, feathery wings, like angels. She began to envision this. She turned around and looked back down the rows, and she pictured everyone sitting there with these things. Okay. Then I think she nodded off, took a little nap. When she woke up, there was no smoke in the cabin. The baby was quiet. Everybody would settled down. Everybody was cool. So she's telling us about this. She says, on the way home, I'm going to try this again. You know what happened? On the way home, we all tried it. Everybody did. I'm hoping you'll try it now that you've heard it. And not just when you get on an airplane, but wherever you happen to be. And even if people aren't causing you trouble. Even if nobody's annoying you. So here's an assignment for this week. When you're driving around this week, this is a cool time to do this. You know how, you, it, like you're, you're here, and the left turn lane over here is turning in front of you, so going this way, right? And you can kind of see people's heads as they go by more closely, and you're, you're stopped, so you're not endangering anybody by looking, right? And all these folks are, however, you know, 20 cars or whatever, get through the light. Picture them. Picture them with the big wings. Bless them. Love them. Wish them well on their way. Wish them well on their way. Wish them well on their way. Man, I tell you the difference it will make. You'll find people come out of nowhere to wish you well on your way. And they'll say so. And they'll do so. And they'll wave you into traffic. And all of a sudden, for as long as you can go, without saying to yourself, I don't believe it. <laughs> okay? For as long as you can sustain this kind of thinking, you'll have a little edge of heaven going on. Bigger edge, really, than little, you know? That's how it works. So next week, please come and or watch, I guess one or the other, I guess you could come in here and sit and watch. People do that. They go to sporting events and watch the game they're at, you know. I suppose you could. But in any event, do not miss what Danielle has to say next week, next Sunday. Let's know together now there is one life, one power, one presence, pure spirit everywhere manifesting. It created this beautiful day. It created this amazing season called autumn, which has only just begun. And we've had a taste of it in the weather. And we're ready for more. And it summons up within us all sorts of feelings and sensations about autumn's past, all the way back to childhood, and maybe big piles of leaves that we dived into, and the distant smell of leaves smoke, you know, as wisps fill the air, pumpkins, and all of this sort of thing present in our hemisphere, in our memory. Pumpkin spice latte. And whatever to you is special. The birthdays and anniversaries that fall in this season, the commemorations and memorials of those who've gone on before. It's safe for us to feel. The feeling is our salvation. Because it's the only thing, the only thing that can usher us into the paradise that we seek. Is to open to our, our hearts to the idea that it's already here. So I invite us to know one and all, just as there are healthy treats going in that box on the table, we're going to give healthy treats to ourselves. We're going to treat ourselves to know that we can change our minds, open our hearts, 
be free, happy, joyous in this moment. To call something into being that is desperately eager to be born in this world at this time. For this knowing and its manifestation and form everywhere we turn, I am so deeply grateful. I release this word now into the infinite, calling it done, and so it is. And now, am I on? Okay. And now, as our ushers make their way to the back, I want to thank each and every one of you for whatever you give to our center. Just know that no matter what it is, how big or how small, we use it not only to keep the lights on and keep this going, but also to serve our greater community at large. So thank you for your donations. And I invite you now to say with me, divine love through me, blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. All right. We do a lot of praying and a lot of treatment and a lot of affirming around here. And so uh, just... For your information, uh, the practitioners of the day are Jim Cantor in the room. He will meet you back in the children's room after the service. And Ann Richardson is, going, is our pod on the phone. So if you are not in the room and want to check in with a practitioner, she will be available for 10 to 20 minutes after the service. Uh, check out the comments for the link for that. Uh, and I'll tell you the same thing about Jim, but once you get in the room with him, I take no responsibility about how long he keeps you in there. <laughs> He's very, very, very good. So, um, and Danielle also kicked herself for forgetting to ask if there was anybody new with us today. So if you're in the room and would like the information packet, let us know. We'll get you that. And if you're online, please drop us a comment. Tell us where you're from. Tell us where you're watching from or send us a message. We'll check it out and get with you. All right. Um, and then I get the wonderful joy of treating us out of the room. Um, but I am going to, since Jesse mentioned the meme, and I will put this meme up, and I've done it before, but it, it relates to what he said today. You are allowed to be both a masterpiece and a work in problem progress simultaneously it's like you already are a masterpiece exactly as you are right now god loves you just the way you are but you are welcome to keep adding paint or whatever medium you want to work in as long as you want as long as you want you are both at the same time it's the beautiful thing about being human is it is a paradox all right um, at which point uh, let's do that let's treat let's know let's know who we are and know that there is one life one power one presence one love that life is my life right here right now I am living both that material life and that spiritual life. I move through both worlds and I do it with ease. And as I know this about myself, so too do I know it about each and every one of you, that you walk the path, that it is easily seen, it is easily laid out, it is straight, it is beautiful, it is amazing. And it is in both worlds, both the material and the spiritual. And everything that you need to walk that path is provided for you. If you need a rest stop, it's there. If you need a hydration station, it's there. If you need information, it's there. As Rumi says, we are not a drop in the ocean. We are the ocean in a drop. What you need, you have. What you desire is seeking you. It is merely awaiting your attention, your consciousness, 
and your acceptance. So I know you for the bright light godlings that you are. I know you for the love that flows through you. And I know that you know it too. And I know this in all gratitude. The gratitude to walk through this world surrounded by godlings, surrounded by the children of God who know who they are, surrounded by the people that love, that love without fear, that love with passion, that love with light. And I know this, and I feel this, and I love this, and I release knowing it is so, and so it is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And I love it. And so it is.